Welcome to episode 57 of the Sourcing Challenge Show. I'm your host, Mark Dongren. In this episode, I sat down with Kay Kellison from Silo Group in California, in the US, and asked her how she got into sourcing. You know, <laughs> okay, it's a, it's a long story, but um, <laughs> one of the things I really want to point out that I really find it interesting, most of the people who are recruiter sourcers have always been in a position of service serving somebody or serving clients or serving people to make them feel good or stuff like that. So I was in the Navy for seven years. I got out. Um, I, from Hawaii, I moved to Washington cause I'd never been. And I went to art school and as I was at art school, um, I did various jobs. I was a bartender, pizza to- tosser and stuff like that. And then I met my wife. Um, she was going to college and stuff like that. I met her as a bartender. She was a waitress. Um, When she graduated from college, um, she got recruited by this, uh, a friend of ours, um, to be a career counselor. Um, And so at a college. And so um, she started doing that. And she was doing the enrollment and stuff. Meanwhile, I was trying to find a job in the art because I was a graphic designer and stuff like that. And it was just like back then it was paper. Yeah. Like I had to write resumes, <laughs> send them out. You know? With there your was, portfolio, you know, send, asking yeah. them to send it back. <laughs> yes. And, and by mail with the stamp um, <laughs> um, and, no, and paper, going through the paper and stuff like that. And I just wasn't really getting any luck. And then I finally landed a job at a... Uh, a photo, a photographer's work uh, studio where I was doing, um, developing the prints and stuff like that. Five dollars an hour, right? Which is like, okay, great, buddy. Um, but I didn't like living to paycheck to paycheck. And then finally, I'm like, oh, God. And you know, I'm a very creative person, so I started thinking about. I was like, you know, I want to be a hairstylist. You know, I like that freedom. I like the freedom and artistic and stuff. And I'm like, I could cut hair. Um, And my interest was men's grooming, like men's cuts and stuff. So I went to uh, American Crew training and I got my um, license. And back then I was pretty heavy. So I lost a lot of weight, but I was a pretty heavy person. Um, And so that kind of prevented a lot of who I am because of my weight um, and the discrimination that I faced. Um, But I graduated top of my class because I really wanted to do well. And so I started getting interviews and this was back in, um, gosh, 2000 and I mean, 1997, 96. Um, so as I was going around, um, I had been networking, um, in person at a salon up in, um, in the gay community called Capitol Hill in Washington. And I just fell in love with the studio, this salon, because they were just so lovely and stuff like that. And I went in and it turned out like uh, they said that because of my weight, I wouldn't attract customers. I mean, they literally said that. And this was my community, the, the one community that you never think that would be discriminating and stuff. But because it was a gay man salon, not that that matters, but... I thought I would be welcome. I had all, I had the skills. I had the looks, you know, yes, I was heavy, but I never thought that would happen. And that just crushed me. The honesty that they, they looked at it being honest as if it was helping yeah. me, but, but it didn't help. It, it was, I went to, I went through a really bad depression and I didn't know what to do. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, I, uh, when I went through school, I had my first apple which mm-hmm. was that in 1991 and I graduated in 92 and I still had it. And then I got to the various apples as it grew. Um, and then there was the World Wide web. Google wasn't even around. Microsoft was just a little word. Um, and the internet, I think my first experience of networking and stuff was in AOL chat rooms. You know, I started talking to developers and stuff through MySpace. EPSs. And and just be, yeah and I and just because I was an artist I wasn't even recruiting then I wasn't even doing anything such a thing but the internet just fascinated the hell out of me and I think that's what drove my interest in research and discovery and the hunt right so Mary my wife um, 
she started, you know, as she was meeting students, she met this one student um, who was doing her master's and stuff. And she goes, hey, we have a little startup, um, Meridian Partners, and we'd really like you to come as a recruiter. And Mary's like, what is that? And they're like, what's well, the same thing what you do in here? But, you know, it's more about, you know, interviewing candidates, placing them at Microsoft. So we in the Meridian Partners was a little company that did internal website design and business mm -hmm. development and then also placed contractors with Microsoft. Um, I don't think Amazon was, I think Amazon was like this big. Um, yeah, they were, I mean, very still, little still selling books. I, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so I, you know, and so she started this and she would come home and she goes, yeah, I got to look for resumes. I'm like, what are you talking about? And so we started talking and I started doing some work for her on the side, just like, because of the fascination of trying to find resumes or looking up newspaper uh, news, uh, news listservs mm -hmm. and, and, and stuff like that. And then I would find candidates and that's the first time I got exposed to, um, and this is 98 monster. Mm -hmm. And, and then I started looking at it and then finally, I think it was like three months in, she goes, well, I just, there's an opportunity at the office and would you want to be interested? And I'm like, well, what do I have to do? And she goes, well, basically manage like, you know, contracts, um, going out and finding posting jobs, um, looking at resumes, you know, that kind of stuff. I'm like, well, I could do that. So before I'd never interviewed like this before. Right. So before the night before I stood, I did some research about the company and then I did this and I'm a visual person. So I did like a PowerPoint presentation on how I see what's happening and how I can move it forward. Um, and, and I knew I was interviewing against somebody else internally. So I, cause I wanted this job really bad. And so I went in there and I knew some people already because Mary was working there. It was the first time I was interviewed like six people at a time. <laughs> I, like, I, I sat there and like, usually you do one interview and you get the job this time in the tech world. It's like I had six recruiters and I think the interview lasted like five hours. And the, and it's funny because I think about it now and I'm like, wow, you know, the questions they asked, I was like very the same, but I had to answer them differently. I, I thought at the end I got the job. But one of the recruiters after six months working with me came up to me and said, you know, I'm really, I'm really embarrassed to say this, but I wanted to let you know how really happy I'm working with you. But the way you looked, I wasn't sure you were a fit. And I'm like, wow, you really judge me by my looks because I was getting ready to go to do the salon because I had working at a barbershop with my tattoos and I had black outfit. And my hair was platinum white with spikes and makeup and, you know, and I had jewelry. Um, he just didn't think I was a fit for technology. Mm. And I'm like, well, little did he know that's the majority of us in the technology world. And ever since then, I've just honed in my skills. I've always been corporate. I never did agency. Um, and I worked with some of the best companies like Microsoft, Amazon back then, you know, um, I've done Groupon uh, and all spectrums. So I've done tech, non-tech, um, legal, um, finance, uh, marketing and stuff like that. So I don't, I'm a firm believer is that you don't have to specialize in industry to be who you are. It's your passion that drives you to success. So, um, and I've learned a lot and I've gotten beat up a lot because I'm one of very specialized researcher where I don't call candidates. Mm -hmm. Um, I did that in the first 13 years of my career because I was forced. Um, I'm a firm, but I don't think, I think sourcing and recruiting is sort of starting to mix up a little bit. Um, it's kind of muddled and there truly isn't a definition where back in the day there was a definition. And I think the more the company started looking and leadership, I think they thought, well, we can get bigger bang for our buck if we, you know, hired a source and recruiter and they could do the same job, but let's pit them together for their metrics and let's measure them wrong. 
Um, and I think we're losing out on so much data and so much information because of the expectations being set for sourcers and recruiters are the same. And the context um, switching as well. It's like rather yeah. than just being able to focus on what you're good at and for a lot of for a lot of us, for what you actually enjoy doing in that process, we, yep. we get, you know, we get measured on something and then end up like the recruiters end up having to source because otherwise they won't reach their target. Right. And sourcers, researchers end up having to do administrative stuff and chasing candidates because that's what we get measured on. Yep. And the definition of strategy is driving me nuts. The definition of passive and active, it's like, come on, guys. It's like, I, I, I am very fortunate though, tell you the truth, Mark. Like, so I've been in industry for a very long time. And for the past four and a half years, I've worked at what the best company so far. And I've worked with some big companies, but Zillow, I don't, I know it's the leadership. Um, Annie Ryan, uh, her and I go back, to, we started together at a startup, the Meridian Partners. And Annie Ryan's our VP. And I'm telling you, she's a leadership that I want to be. Because she leads with kindness. Yes, there is some things that some really tough choices you have to make that we don't usually see because we're not exposed to that, right? But the transparency she has implemented into our team is just amazing. And how she appreciates an individual. We do have metrics. We do have measurements. But you can't achieve those measurements if you force people to do things what they don't like. If you empower them to their passion. And yes, there are some challenges. And one of the things that I've learned is leading with yes and, instead of like, no, I don't want to do that and stuff. Um, and the value that you can achieve when you value people um, and challenge them on how they can look at it. And I've been so amazed because usually people want to hire me and they do a bait and switch. Like they're a, oh, we want a researcher, yeah. And I'm like, do you truly? You just have to do three sixty sometimes. <laughs> but it's like this percentage, like sixty percent research, twenty percent <laughs> recruit. And I'm like, no, 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 no. It's like if you're gonna hire me and moving forward, like when I started interviewing, it's like I want it in my agreement that you're not gonna try to make me into a recruiter or a recruiting sourcer and stuff because there are some people who love that. And they don't want to do the research. I can spend hours on a project, on just a subject, uncovering, peeling back the onion and delivering the data to make that conversation with a hiring manager much more um, impactful or uh, educational for the hiring manager because they needed that to understand how to build out their teams. Like for, for instance, Zillow, I've been on a research project with the marketing team and I work with an incredible CMO, Amy Johnson, and her vision of turning marketing into such a consumer focus. It's about the customer and stuff, which is really hard sometimes. Um, I helped her re or redesign her entire team based on my research. And it doesn't take a, it's not about the secret sauce or anything like that, which by the way, I can't believe I just said that because I hate that word. <laughs> Um, but it, or that, you know, uh, what's the other one? It's so sexy. Ugh, that's, it's like, man, no. Um, but it's more about bringing stuff to the table to have that hiring manager rethink about their team. And, and, and luckily for me, I work on the exec team that we have people in our team are so passionate about what they do and we utilize each other's strengths. We're not pitted against each other. Mm -hmm. um, we do have our challenges. And if we have to step in, we step in. But we have our, our own role and how that adds the value to the entire experience. I've never experienced that before. And, it, and I think it's because of leadership. Leadership, um, Rich Barton is our CEO and he's put us, he's put us first. You know, we've had our our company and he's been very transparent every time he, he meets with us as a whole company virtually. Um, and it's funny cause they're like, this is the best kind of all hands we've ever experienced, you know? <laughs> um, but he's very upfront about the finances, about our vision. Um, we're good and we're secure because Zillow is the first company is actually invested in the people. Mm -hmm. And then that by doing that, they're also very cautious on how they spend the money. 
And some companies hurry up and spend money on product and stuff and they don't spend enough time on the people. And it's really the people who are the ones that make the company successful. That's my belief. You know? Absolutely. So in a nutshell, that's, that's my career. I went from hairstylist, um, colorist to now a, a principal researcher. And I've never looked back uh, on, in the Navy. I was in the Navy, a nuclear welder. Okay. Where did you go to learn? So, like, who are some of the people that kind of oh, early days had an influence? Or where did you, because I, I've spoken, I, like, there's very few of the original gangsters that, you know, U.S. has a, U.S. and specifically Washington probably has more than most. Um, yeah. But, you know, where do you go before, you know, doing internet? Like, I remember getting my first internet connected computer in like 97 as well. It's like, <laughs> not a lot of things you can research and, no. and there's no blocks <laughs> out there. Then, you know, where do you, where did you go? Well, um, a lot of mine was books mm -hmm. for definitely, but my first place where I did my research was the library. Uh, uh, what do you call, I don't even forget what it's called now. Um, the the film what's it called Mic you know what microfilm I'm, yeah microfish microfish um it's also like investigations like i would i've always been like a murder mystery kind of girl um i'm also into paranormal i ghost hunt and i think it's that um the curiosity yeah. you know that like i think my nickname at work is alice because i go down the rabbit hole <laughs> there's a lot of things in that rabbit hole that people don't think about. And it, it takes a certain unique person. And I don't think there's many of us like that because our industry has evolved. Like you have to be on the phone, you have to be on the phone. And one of the things I'm not a really fan of is how we berate people. Um, if they're not doing the right role or they're not doing the role or whatever. Um, so I would say books, um, I would also say I surrounded my people uh, around people like Jim Stroud. Uh, Michael Marley is one of my huge, I'm a huge fan of Michael Marley. He, I don't know if you've met Michael Marley, but he was, so. uh, he, you know, I try to um, surround my, myself with people who are in, innovating, um, kind, um, generous, um, and learn from each other. Even, you know, even if it's the same topic, we all have different perspectives. So Michael Marley was one of my first, one of the first speakers at SourceCon. He was talking about mobile when mobile was still kind of like, woo, you know. Um, I made my first app um, back in the day when Apple was the only one. And I did search on the go, interview on the go. I've taken them down because I'm really trying to think about how to move it forward. And I'm trying to do it myself. Um, so, and Michael Marley did the first MREC uh, conference. So some first mobile conference where I spoke at as well. And that's where Shannon and I met Shannon Pritchard. Um, we were both very into apps and we would like work off each other on how to stalk people on apps. Um, um, yeah, I would say Michael N Nataro. Um, uh also marvin smith mm -hmm. um amy beth quinn who i adore uh, i just love how we share and i've really enjoyed seeing her evolution as um from researcher now manager and a senior manager and stuff and you know amy for me i find so amazing because she's such a quiet person she's actually really shy and everything and she's She's just, she's a testament on giving a platform and surrounding herself with encouraging people. And I think Leslie O'Connor really gave us that platform. Um, and I, and I understand evolution. I, I kind of wish SourceCon was still back uh, scrappy. Um, I think it's a little bit, for me, it's a little stuffy sometimes, but I, I understand to some degree, but it's changed so much that I get confused on what it, the purpose is. You know, and uh, and as much as I do support SourceCon and everything, I just wish it was still for us. Like for a hundred, us, hundred yeah. people event where yeah, yeah, you're, you're sitting in front of the laptop rather than in front of I mean, stage. I can't tell you, when we had hackathons, it was dark after hours and we're at a bar and we're having fun. <laughs> now it's all organized and, you know, no drinking and stuff like that. And it's just like, okay, you know, 
uh, and I know it's about the sponsors and stuff like that, but I do really miss the, the days where it was scrappy and it didn't feel like you have to, you know, have speaker experience to speak. I just, it tears it down. And, um, and I, I wish something like that starts up again, you know, um, I think that's where we can find the newer sourcers. They, they feel like they can be themselves. Um, it's intimidating to be on stage, as you know, and I know it's like, why would it, you know, but when you start interacting and stuff, you'll say, oh, they're just like us, you know. Um, but yeah, that's in a nutshell, that's my life. So you've seen the development as well from, you know, kind of smaller teams where you're more in the kind of traditional headhunter research roles to extremely big corporate teams with, you know, 50, 100 designated sourcers. What's mm -hmm. kind of been from you, has there been one kind of team where you think this is, this is really the kind of, this is the setup that I, that I think, you know, fits the best or is it, does it just always have to continue to, to evolve? I think come revolution, come evolving, we have to make some changes, but I think some of those changes is really how we find our leaders. Um, I think some of the leadership is, some of it's great, but I think, you know, you, you kind of like when a person's hiding, you kind of go, hmm, when they don't have any recruiting experience and stuff, you know, you, you're trying to understand why were they selected or, um, but I honestly, and I have to be as honest because I can't really fluff it. Um, I haven't yet seen a sourcing model that truly works. And when, and when to me, and, and, and it could be because I've never been in a role to where I had a lot of influence. I do feel like I have influence, but I challenge that in a way to where my main concern, there's a lot of sourcing models, but what happens is that sourcers are placed in the service and recruiters think the sources are the clients. And I think it's words that we use really damage our career um, or our relationship. And I think sourcing and recruiting can't be successful if you don't have those relationships, strong relationships, and if you don't have accountability. And when recruiters aren't held accountable, and I have worked with some amazing recruiters, and I've worked with some really shitty recruiters. And that's because of how we place each other in certain roles. And I think that damages so I think sourcing strategies can work, but we're so busy trying to put off responsibility on others or a company trying to save money by saying, yes, I want you to be a researcher, but it, by the way, after 90 days, we need you on the phone 24 seven, fuck off. I'm not going to, that's not how it works. And I personally think that we really need to start thinking about sourcing strategies as part of a human strategy and how we use our strength. And Zillow is an example, even though they have some challenges um, and I would like to see sourcers be more seat at the table um, because sometimes recruiters get that um, uh, competitiveness. We all competitive recruiting. You couldn't in recruiting. We, we have competitiveness. I think it's a healthy competitiveness. And when you have a team, then the team should be measured, not the individual, you know? So like if you have a recruiter sourcer and a business partner, an HRBP or, and a, and a hiring manager, that is a team. It's a and hiring team. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that should be a measurement, attainable measurement on all aspects. It, it doesn't, as the shit rolled downhill, it's not the sourcer with the catcher's mitt catching the shit. It's more like, Sorry, I don't mean to swear. <laughs> but, but to me, I think my most frustration is when I see sourcers just feeling beat up yeah. because they're, they're being asked to do things and they're not being met halfway. And, and it's so frustrating because it's 22 years later and it still has the same conversations. I can't tell you at so many conferences, there's so many great ideas, but I haven't seen anything different. And um, I am very fortunate that I have yet to been asked to call, but I, that's in my contract. Like, don't ask me to do that because you'll, you'll cure all my spirit. There is value in research. Um, measurement in research is really how 
the total process is successful. Like if I'm bringing um, market data or talent mapping and stuff, I'm making that team successful by the product that I'm serving, right? Um, I do list and all that kind of stuff. And it's funny because I don't even use half the tools. I'm old school sourcer. And when I use tools, which I think are valuable, I still have to double check that because sometimes it's like, ooh, I find an email. Most of that time is old email that doesn't even work because it's what's out there on the internet or some algorithm background predicting on the email. And if you just trust that tool, it's just not going to work. But I'm old school. Like I still look in a phone book and I know some people may not know what a phone book is, but I almost <laughs> brought it. Um, but it's, it's just that investigating that is still a need. Um, but I get concerned about the relationship and now we have sorcerers recruiters and that's so confusing. <laughs> it's like, what? Like, are you a sorcerer recruiter? You know, what, what is that meaning? That's like a double meaning. Um, but that's a title these days, you know, and that's fine. You know, I just look at someone who's just constantly in LinkedIn doing that because of unrealistic goals or they're not bringing data. I think sourcers could be used differently. I think they have exposure to things that aren't being utilized mm -hmm. and, and not even thought of and not challenging the source. Like, okay, with that concept, bring back data. And that could bring such a stronger, richer conversation when they're doing their kickoff meetings or stuff like that, that their sourcer can have add more value. But because a recruiter and sourcer don't define that role, it it's not even it's not even thought of. So there's more and more tools coming, and, and uh, you know, as you said as well, it's like actually doing it old school. It's it's a lot of kind of what the training world is as well. It's like I will I will teach you how to do it manually, and then show you tools that can help you do it automate it, do it more effectively. Yep. But if you want to be successful, you need to understand what you're doing, uh, not necessarily how. Yeah, I think that's where we, li we eliminate that um, part of the skill. Uh, when you have tools and you rely on tools, you're not really focused on how you're developing your skills. Yeah. Um, as a researcher, source or recruiter and stuff, if you're just looking, you're just waiting for candidates to come into your pipe from an automated tool, you're not really serving a, a meaningful purpose. And I don't need, my soul would just like get dark and shrink up because I need to be challenged, you know? Um, and I, I do a lot of challenges. Like right now I'm trying to find a VP integrated marketing who's African American and has a military background. That, I mean, that, I'm, and I'm, email. That, that, I, that's not a filter on LinkedIn. <laughs> And honestly, I don't own a LinkedIn recruiting license. Um, I think it has value to some degree, but I can see that I could get that value by x-raying or other re other resources. Um, and so what, I, I mean, not not using lots of tools. What what is your process? I'm sure like after 22 years, you have you're set in your way in some things of kind of knowing like where do I start when I get a role like that. Well, you know, it, it, it is about how much information you get from the hiring manager um, and revisiting and revisiting and adjusting. Because as you know, when you're presenting ideas, you're presenting candidates, slate of great candidates, the hiring manager keeps on changing that job, you know. And it's also dealing with hiring managers that may not have a lot of experience of hiring or developing an entire team and restructuring based on digital, you know, which is a constantly evolution changing atmosphere. So the, to me, if you don't have a strong relationship and an understanding and patience, then no tool in the world is going to do it. And I, I mean, I use certain tools, but I also use the internet. I mean, it's amazing just a basic how Google is formatting your, your queries and stuff. You don't really have to have balloon strings anymore, no. but it's how you approach it how you, you know, the questions you ask, how you phrase it, how, I mean, people get stuck on key terms when you can search on phrases, you can search on just atmosphere. I mean, it's just really weird. Um, image search, I don't think is used enough. And I'm not talking photographs. I'm talking about content and data that is shared out there. 
and how you search for that, it's amazing how much. Um, I don't think patents are used enough. I don't think um, even just in person, like I, when I'm trying to reach somebody and I will do this occasionally, it freaks out my manager, but I'll actually do a personal video and send a video to that individual. And I don't know if it's a right phone, but whoever it is, is getting a nice message from me, getting my name and a LinkedIn invite or whatever, just to connect so they can see I'm not a psycho. Yeah. Right. That you're a real um, person. Yeah. And, and I don't think, you know, and when I share that with the sourcers and recruiters who are actually on the phone, they freak out like, no, I don't want to do that. I'm like, why not? You know, it's just a video message. It's a 30 second video message. Um, so I, and I don't really stick to one process because I think different, different um, ways of finding people. Um, I think uh, social communities are huge uh, gold mine, but I think we're so stuck on trying to find a person's email. Mm -hmm. I can care less. I can get their email some other way. Understanding that person in the social setting is the way to I connect with people or I share data or de details with the hiring manager or the recruiters like you know because most of our hiring managers have no problem reaching out to our candidates and i think that's the best experience anyways and i think our recruiters and sourcers kind of they get it but then they're like well what do i do like uh you know um if i have to explain you're doing your service by providing coaching and and helping that uh, hiring manager understand why it's important for them to do the reach outs as, as well. But providing further information about that candidate and have that more uh, natural connection. It's like, hey, you know, I read this article. That, that's what I mean. And that's I mean, how I try to- Yeah, get, getting away from saying, must have CV, that's my KPI, how many CVs yep. I sent to a manager. With a lot of the roles that we, we service, CVs are useless and I, mean, right. I, I haven't had one for probably six years because yep. I don't believe in them. Um, I hate having to ask for them, um, but like I would rather work with a manager who said, look, let's look at their social footprint. Let's look at their portfolios together yep. before yep. I contact them so that I know if this is a person that is interested in talking to us, yep. I, don't, I don't have to sell them the role and then turn around selling them to you. I know yep. that you're already bought in on that. Um, yep. And yeah, if you can actually get the manager to help you with the contacting of those prospective candidates, then you have that sell. Cause then like, okay, maybe it's not a list of a hundred, like you would do, uh, most sources do. It's 10 people that could yep. actually do this job. So let's focus on those yep. 10. And really, Ajay, I think the more you share and be transparent because that's a fancy word that we overuse a lot, transparency, authenticity. Um, I think when we bring in the hiring manager into our process and share with them, that's where sourcing sessions come in too. It's like, okay, I'm going to sit down and show you what we actually do. It, it kind of lights a fire. Um, if the hiring manager is truly invested in the whole process, and there's some prima donna hiring managers that just don't, don't have time for that. Um, which is difficult to work with, yeah. but you, there are some, and so you have to adjust. And when I'm in the exec role, like I work on the exec roles and stuff, we do have some hiring managers who are jumping in, who are helping. Um, but then we have some managers like, well, that's your job. It's like, okay, but let's step, take a step back and let's look at what our jobs are. And we are working under the same company and we are hiring the same people. So having that partnership and trust may take a little longer, but the more you share and the more you bring value to the table and organize and you're only saying, I want you to contact these top five people and these are the reasons why and you have all that data built up, the hiring manager is going to look at you like you're some God. And on top of that, you're writing the messages for them and asking them to read it over, make sure you're in their voice or you're helping them write a job description it's our job to be a coach. It's our job to help them be better of who they are and vice versa. And the more you help them, you get stronger in what you do and you get your confidence. And it's not like forcing anybody and it's not like, oh, you're not, oh, the hiring manager's doing your job. No, we all work under the same company. We're all trying to get people hired and we have to utilize everybody to 
really bring in the best talent. And that's my firm belief. You know, I don't know how anybody else can argue that. I know you work a lot with, uh, with people who are new to the industry or mm -hmm. just need help in general or, or advice. What would be your advice to, to people? I mean, probably especially now coming over to the dark side of sourcing or who just look at sourcing and say like that, that might be the specialist and that could be something for me. Where do they start? Where do they go? And, you know, what, what, what's your advice on based on your 22 years of experience? Like where do people go now? I think, um, they need not to be afraid to ask. Mm -hmm. um, I think our community has proven time and time again. And when I say our community, I'm talking about SourceCon, um, but other communities too. Um, I think it's been proven that we're there to help. I think there's a lot of people who are approachable. Um, I think there's some really good, honest people. But I also think you need to do homework. It's like you got to really sit back and think about what it is that you really want to do. And even though it may not be a direct path, it's how you get there and how you surround yourself with knowledge um, and never stop learning. And I think people who think they stop learning, um, I don't get that. And, and people like when I interview people and when I'm mentoring people, it's like, just because I'm mentoring you doesn't mean I'm not learning from you. So it's a two way street. Um, I think in finding somebody who resonates with you um, spending time um, respectfully, um, mentoring, I think reading, um, not just books, but like, don't always think you have to sign up for courses to learn. There's so much out there for free that people are sharing left and right. There's videos like you do videos, Greg Hawk does videos. There's so much knowledge and I know it can get overwhelming. So that's when you have to really take a step back and, and think about what it is um, that you want to do in recruiting. I think there are certain paths that can lead to different ways. So like when someone's interested in sourcing, the first thing I ask is like, is it sourcing you want to stay in or do you want to move somewhere? You know, and specifically coordinators, right? Those mm -hmm. are the unrepresentative people that we don't think about and they work their ass off. Yeah. I don't know. I wouldn't be able to do it. Um, and coordinators have such a different um, perspective and, so I don't look at them as coordinator. I look at them as project managers. Like they manage so much. Um, but there are some people, some coordinators thinking, well, I want to be a recruiter. Great. I think they should start out as a sourcing because sourcing and recruiting go hand in hand. Whether you want to be a full cycle recruiter or a client facing recruiter or a sourcing recruiter or a sourcer or a researcher. Um, I can only think of three people, myself, Amy Beth and um, Dan Harris. I've been in research for a very long time um, and we stuck to it. And Amy moved into more of a sourcing recruiting manager and that's her path. Dan and I, we're strictly researchers. Um, however, how I learned is by just absorbing everything, asking questions with curiosity um, and then challenging myself in positions that scare the shit out of me. Um, and what I've learned in the last four years is leading with yes and, and right. So it's it, because the minute you say, no, I don't want to do that. You limit yourself on exploring the unknown, you know, and you do, you can have some certain boundaries, but challenging yourself and pushing yourself and finding different ways to get there could be different than the way I do. So I would say definitely find a mentor. Um, surround yourself with like-minded people, push yourself to some of the challenges that you might be fear of the unknown um, and take courses, you know, but a lot of those courses are built on those who've been there before yep. and all that information's out there on the internet, you know, and don't feel like failure is the, like, it's hard for us to fail because I know a lot of us are goal oriented um, which I want to change. I'm on a mission to change recruiting. Um, I don't know how much I've done that so far, but I know I have a legacy out there. Um, but I think understanding you're human, you have needs, and you lead with kindness, and you lead with an open heart, and I think it'd be amazing how much you would grow from that, you know? 
and people who are generous like you and, and Jim and stuff like that, really surround those people, around yourself with those people. And it'd be amazed on how, how I'm shocked at how much people are willing to just give up time to share. You know, it's what we do, what we love. Absolutely. You've been in Washington pretty much since there was one company that had any number of people or more than 50 and seen it grow to now rivaling Bay San Francisco Bay Area. Yeah. Um, for, uh, you know, for a recruiter who either gets a role, has to start staffing an office there or an idiot like me from Europe who has to start working in, in, in Washington, you know, what, what do we need to know? What do we need to do differently? Um, what's, the, what's the secret to, uh, to sourcing in, in that area? Well, first, I'm in California now. Uh, I was in, C in Washington for 23 years. <laughs> I, I think, um, and I'm glad I moved. You know, I think sometimes we, like you, right? I, I, in Washington, it's funny how we, it, industry is huge, right? But it's not. Because in Washington, you either go into Starbucks, Microsoft, Amazon, back to Microsoft, back to Amazon, back to <laughs> Starbucks, right? And I'm like, oh, my God. Um, I didn't really feel challenged. I mean, there's challenges. But I, I wanted to stay away from those bigger companies. I, I think it got toxic for a little bit, and then it's improving. I think um, some of the things to think about when you're wanting to, um, like thinking about the Mecca of Washington is understanding the atmosphere, understanding the competition. It's pretty fierce. Um, and how you want your reputation because of the community it is. Um, how are you showing up in the community? I mean, I'm shocked sometimes to hear like the people in Wa the sources in Washington never heard of source sourcing seven, which you know is funny, and it just shows you like the how you're just focused on your job, and you're not understanding the wealth of knowledge is out there, because we don't allow that. We don't allow people to actually explore their development, because there's always a um, a symbol a money on there and it isn't you know there's a lot of generous people so I would read I would also understand the environment the competition what's out there reach out to people who are actually living there um, and see um, it's funny when I left Washington I never thought I'd go back but now I'm at Zillow and I go up to Seattle once a month <laughs> you know and it's fun because I don't live there thank god um, <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm moving to California. My health has gotten better. I've just feel more freer, um, and less toxic because, you know, sometimes our industry can get kind of mean and I don't want to live my life that way. And it was hard because I had built quite a, uh, network, yeah. but it's, I mean, 23 years is not yeah. a short amount well, of time. And, well, the funny thing is, if it wasn't for the internet, I don't know how that network would be, but mm -hmm. I have all my network still with me. Yeah. And that's why I think it's really important is to network and educate yourself about the environment. And, what could, and one of the things I keep on telling people is like, what makes you stand out is how you can deliver a diverse slate of candidates, how your knowledge about diversity, because it's such an important topic these days that we can't, we can't really get away from it. And people, and it is hard. Diversity is hard because definition of diversity, so it's changing all the time. Yep. But if you're not reading, if you're not educating yourself on it, you're not going to stand out. And as a sorcerer, if you can focus on some of that success, you'll really stand out. It's, it's getting know? out of your own bubble and finding out, like, if you keep, if you surround yourself with people that are exactly like you, then you're only ever going to know that. But yeah, looking up and finding out, look, I'm a, you know, white Anglo-Saxon male. And I, I'm not, and yeah, but I come from a working class Scandinavian background, right. um, which um, I'm used to having to adapt to survive because one, yeah. nobody speaks my language and I'm from a small country that, you know, that's just what it is. Yeah. But that is nothing compared to what, you know, what a lot of, people who are struggling is in so i know i'm in a privileged place but if you if you keep surrounding yourself with your own kind of people then you're never going to see that no so yeah no. looking at that and reading and finding out like where do i find this information in a, it, it in really, a safe place for me as well yeah well and i also think is about i think you're going to be successful if you're 
you really truly understand what you're passionate about. I, I find it, I, I mean, it's taken me a while, honestly, to really identify what I'm passionate about, you know, because it's not like I don't like talking to people on the phone and stuff. I just find it boring. That's all. Um, talking to people in person, like if I'm at a networking event or hosting something, that's a different because you're getting, you have that body language and stuff on the phone. It's like, you know, you're there to do a 25, 30 minute, which I can't look at us. It's like, we've been talking for an hour now and I can talk to you forever. And to me, I, I don't, that repetitive, like selling the company and stuff that doesn't challenge me as a creative person, you know, um, finding, helping someone find a job, helping someone, understand about a job or understand about them. Like I coach a lot on um, improving your LinkedIn. God knows we all need that. Um, We're telling the story and stuff. I love that. And I'm there to help them, but give me a challenge. Like I want you to find da 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 and this da da. It's like, I'm on, like it just turns on the light bulb. Um, But understanding your passion is where I think you should start. And a lot of us still don't know our passion. Because I think we're bogged down with unnecessary metrics and stuff like that. Okay, if people want to follow you uh, and like me actually enjoy seeing your creative musings as well, where can they best do that? Um, Well, LinkedIn, KCAL, but I'm mostly, I'm on Instagram. (laughs) So it's Keo's Art, K-E-O-S-A-R-T. Because I'm not just a researcher, I'm an artist, I'm a mom, I love to cook. So I like... I like sharing my whole life because I'm a whole person. So, um, and I'll share a lot of things about my company and stuff like that. But Instagram is where you mostly get my reaction, my DMS and stuff. Um, Facebook, eh, you know, um, but LinkedIn, if you want professionally, I'm welcome. Um, but just write me a message. Just don't send me a link because it's like, if I don't know you, I'm not going to accept you. Um, and yeah. You know, and I'm always, I'm, you just look up my name on, on Google and I'm all over the place. And if you want to know my number and email, you're going to have to find it. (laughs) Perfect. Look, thank you for your time, Kay. You're welcome. Thank you so much. It's been an honor. It's been so lovely to see you. And um, anytime you need me, I'm here. Um, Don't be, don't be a stranger. No, absolutely. I always need you. Definitely. All right. Well, you have a great day. If you like this episode, please consider sharing it or any of the other episodes with a friend or a colleague who might be interested as well. And consider subscribing to the channel, which will help us meet more people um, and grow the community.